All right, great. Um, well, uh, hi, both of you. Glad you could make it. Um, great. Uh, well, you know me, I'm Coltrane. Um, maybe could you guys give a little bit of an introduction about yourselves and your practice? Um, and then we can jump into things. Uh, Ezra? Yeah. Yep. Um, my name's Ezra Jackson. I'm a multidisciplinary designer artist, um, but I'm training right now as a perfumer's assistant and lab assistant uh, with Old Fiction Laboratories in the UK. Um, been there for nearly three years now. I'm working my way up. Um, that's me. Great. I'm Noreen McBride. I'm the curator for the Sentence Society lecture series at the Institute of Art and Olfaction. And I'm also an independent perfumer and I'm a researcher that's uh, mainly looking at olfactive culture and um, the fragrance trade and how it affects uh, society. So, Amazing. In a nutshell. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, well, well, uh, yeah, let's uh, begin. I, I think I just wanted, uh, one of my questions was, I was really interested in from your both of your perspectives, uh, what do you kind of see as the landscape of the scent at the moment, uh, either through uh, perfumery, um, say we were having that conversation, Ezra, about big uh, fragrance companies, mm -hmm. and then maybe from a bit more sociological, histor historical perspective, Nuri. Um, yeah, maybe Nuri, do you want to start? So where I see the landscape right now, um, I think a lot of cultural practices, especially in the sort of developed sphere, uh, developed economies um, have really been pushed into either being something very obscure or being a product. And everything's sort of seen through the lens of a commodity right now. Uh, how can it be commodified? Is it uh, profitable to be commodified? And so you see a lot of uh, traditional practices that have gone on the wayside, uh, the making of you know, pomanders, for instance, there's no economic, um, it's it's not a, a an economically viable option for a commodity. So mm -hmm. you really don't see them anymore, um, which is unfortunate that so much of the gaze has been turned into a product. Uh, but we still see outside of that context, uh, I, I'm almost a pull back and forth in a lot of scent cultures um, that are outside of the developed economies where there's a mix of both wanting the sort of aspirations that uh, conventional Western style perfumery offer that, mm -hmm. you know, you'll smell rich, you'll smell like a million bucks, right? You know, that it will connect yeah. you to this sort of cultural hub that seems accessible through these, uh, these products. Um, but then at the same time, there's also a pull for traditional cultures, traditional ways of scenting. And even in, and if we look at the case of Oud, the opportunity to maybe pull a traditional uh, pr product into the mainstream and, and make it mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And that's kind of a pull back and forth. So that's kind of on the cultural side where yeah. I see things. Um, and I think on the, the business side of things, I think there's a big move related to environmentalism. You know, how can we secure product? How can we seem green? Maybe if we're not green, what does green mean? Um, that's, you know, when I read the trade magazines, that that seems to be the themes that keep coming up over and over again. But I don't know, maybe Ezra, you have a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, um, just leading off the back of what you're saying about commodifying things, uh, Oud is like a really interesting example, um, or maybe interesting is not the right word, but it's a quite particular or peculiar example because of it's a kind of running uh, joke being on the, you know, behind the scenes of how fragrance is made, how much real Oud actually goes into a lot of perfumes because of its mm -hmm. price. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's just the kind of by proximity of it smelling of what is used, it's smelling similar. People immediately, their imagination goes straight to that and they, they, they project, oh, this is this, sometimes exotic thing that, that might be their view um mm. and i think that says again a lot about how culture is commodified now um and fragrance is a kind of distilled way of of seeing that happen of of uh, this kind of um intention um or uh, this tendency rather to hustle culture and to uh 
again commodify elements of cultures um yeah i mean being behind the scenes of like coming from retail as well you'd mm. see that a lot um in various sectors where people uh, people would kind of uh again pick pick uh a certain a certain cultural motif um even if it's not theirs um to run off of and now with the experience of being in a lab and again like actually seeing the material itself that evokes that uh stereotypical thought maybe yeah. Um, it's yeah there's there's a strong kind of uh there's a strong sense of um sorry trying to find the words that yeah there, there, there's a definite there's a definite um t tendency uh and, and fragrance does that in a, in a quite unique way um yeah yeah with, with the a question about the commodification of oud did, does it come say from a Eurocentric commodification, or was it, say, um, from the UA, uh, UAE? Um, did that sort of generate this sort of exoticization and value? Yeah, that. Western that's yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah, definitely from yeah. a European lens. Um, again, yeah. just like the fact that it's not even real oud often. Um, yeah, is a is a kind of example of that. But um, I think you had you had um, early boutique houses come out like Amouage that became incredibly popular, not just in the Middle East, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it gave the Western industry a taste of, oh, this type of perfumery is popular. And it, it kind of also woke them up the idea that there is a Middle Eastern market that wants perfume, that consumes far more perfume than the Western market does. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's something at three times the rate. Um, so it became, how can we sell to that market? How can we put products in that market to create competition from traditional sellers that were already there? Yeah. Uh, and then why they already sort of had those products, they're like, well, we'll, we'll put them out here. And you'll see that the products that get marketed towards um, the Middle East tend to have more real oud, or they tend to be the much higher brand, higher marked prices that will have the better quality, whereas the facsimiles, the accords of oud, because a lot of Western noses also don't have an association with it, it's just sort of woody smelling. You can kind of get away with more of, of a sketch of what oud is as opposed to trying to make something that's exact. So yeah, I think I think they saw what was going on and then they were like, oh, this, this, we can make money. Definitely jumping on that, yeah. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe to add to that, so what are do you what do you see are like major uh, areas of critique or problems within this sort of uh, environment, or that like I mean I mean I'm already seeing a big problem say in the relationship Eurocentric fragrance industry has to other parts of the world, but uh, perhaps you might have some more to shed on that, Ezra. Yeah, um, I mean I think the critique the critique is right now uh small uh there's there's not too too many people i think really having upfront conversation and beyond mm -hmm. the conversation side is the the action i think is quite minimal there's some organizations uh that nur and i actually went to a conference with the uh, the global frankincense alliance where yeah. they're trying to build direct yeah direct mm -hmm. dialogues um and not monologues, not Eurocentric monologues, dialogues between exporters, indigenous peoples, people on the ground, people in the diaspora. And I think that's really positive. Um, that's a really positive step. Uh, so I, yeah, that's 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 a that's a, an example of a, of the kind of shift away from this um, Eurocentric disconnect with the kind of you know Western imagination uh, and maybe the fetishization of other cultures through smell. I think it is about trying to build that. Uh, build that direct link um, mm -hmm. you know, that comes down to trade, tangible stuff. Yeah. So we're starting to see that. But again, the conversation is still relatively in its early days and a lot of things still need to be uh, figured out, um, I think. Again, how things can work on a pragmatic level um, and again, work away from the neo-colonial structures that they're kind of set out on. Um, yeah. Maybe Marie, you could expand on that some more. Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the things that I, I feel that, that the, and look, we both work in this industry. We love this industry. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you know, I think that's kind of important. We, we love what we do, but we also have to recognize what it is and where some of its history has been and, and ask that it be better. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, people can get um, very defensive sometimes. But I, we have to, I think, at the very least, recognize that the perfume trade was built on colonialism. Um, it's one of the oldest global trades that really relied on uh, the colonial structure and then the post-colonial structure. Because mm -hmm. if we're looking at natural materials, the majority of them are not made in Western Europe and North America and Australia. There are some, of course, but um, you, you, even if we're talking about roses in Egypt um, and roses in Bulgaria, the power structure is not evil in there mm -hmm. in how the, and how those products get to market and how they're valued. Um, and we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that the majority of people who are taking an enormous amount of the risk as far as growing naturals, distilling naturals, doing the early stages of the middlemen work yeah. um, are actually people of color and they are not getting nearly as much of the, re of the rewards of these products uh, to the point where it barely seems to trickle down. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of transparency in those lines of communication. How do you get from what's in your in the bottle to the person who you know picked the patchouli leaf? How do we track that process? There are companies that do do that with some of their materials internally, but those things are not usually made available to the consumer. And I think we live in an age where consumers want that. We're seeing that in other um, avenues of consumer products and chocolate. People want to know where their chocolate's coming from. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that is a major issue. I, I think that, I think what scares the industry, however, isn't so much the human costs or the human issues within it, um, but the environmental issues. I think they're very concerned about climate change. We've had disruptions to systems that we thought were going to be in place for a very long time, where <laughs> materials we always had would disappear. We wouldn't have them from one batch to another, or the quality would be very different. So I think they're, on, on an industry side of things, they're thinking very long term about climate change and how do we reposition or change our models to handle that so that it's profitable for the companies that it still remains profitable for. Uh, but naturals are always going to be part of this industry. And yeah. uh, this is an element that I also think needs, uh, as, it needs as much if not more attention because it's more tangible. It's here and it's now. Um, like climate changes yeah. as well. But I think these are the two big pillars that the industry really needs to focus and on. And I think you're right. And then something that, as we mentioned, it requires more of a holistic or like integrated approach uh, related to naturals. Because as I was reading a bit into biotech fragrance, and one of the main key, like we get to bypass, um, you know, uh, trade disputes around products, political disputes, climate problem. So it seems like this, push into biotech fragrance isn't necessarily um well of course it's marketed sustainably but it's also to over um to jump over those sort of uh uncomfortable social problems um mm -hmm. that they may not want to necessarily deal with but i think if you do want to continue having naturals uh products especially as the world continues to change uh that you do have to start engaging within that sort of yeah Definitely. I mean, just to pick up on what Nuri is saying as well, um, for good reason, there is a lot of, you know, intellectual property in the industry is is kept super, super guarded. And there are a lot of, you know, kind of secrets um, kept naturally just out of process, out of materials that are used and how they use. And again, don't get me wrong, there is an amazing quality to how these materials can interact as a design and artistic medium and finding constantly finding new ways to engage naturals and synthetics and vice versa is a, you know an, a massively and fa fascinating and interesting thing as a way to kind of play with memories as a, as a as a sculpting tool but at the same time the transparency i think not just uh, the the lack of transparency in certain ways between perfumers and between again with with the ip um, safeguarding that does kind of transpire to also how uh, things are spoken about again within the trade and within different la layers and levels of the su supply chain but also as well for people trying to get in and engage with the industry 
I think it's very, very difficult, um, you know, for certain people from, from depending on your socioeconomic background or your ethnic background, it's very, very difficult to, to engage at any level. Um, and again, as, as Nuri mentioned, there is a clear global uh, imbalance of, of people of colour generally being the people who actually start the entire process, but are yeah. compensated the least. Um, but yeah, again, even, you know, just, just to give myself an example, if perfumery was never a topic of discussion for me growing up, you know, it was never like, oh yeah, my granddad did it. So it's the, no. here's, here's the framework kind of thing. Not at all. Um, it's definitely been something I've found on my own, but again, it's, there, there are just levels and problems of access on, on multiple uh, tiers within the industry that I see. Um, yeah. Even, even language, mm. so much of the industry oh my God. remains in French. And, and that's really so that it is a bit of a control. We can control how much of the information gets out. Um, and there's certain, you know, there's certain trade magazines that are just not available in English or German or, or other languages. And that if you don't speak French, you are at a disadvantage in this. In this very industry. French thing to do. Yeah. Or polished Queen's English even. Like you need a dictionary review yeah. to understand. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I mean and you really you really need English now as well. So, you know, if you were a perfumer in India and you if you don't feel absolutely comfortable or Bangladesh anywhere, you don't feel absolutely comfortable in English and absolutely comfortable to a certain degree in French, uh, you're going to have limits to how much you can access even just trade knowledge. Right. Um yeah. you know, how 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 to do basic things how to access uh, basic elements of this community, you're going to be at a, at a disadvantage. So it, it makes it um, access to education is a very hard thing in this industry. And part of it is because we cannot protect our products uh, through the law in traditional ways that so we can't copyright them or, or do these types of uh, if, if we had written a book or story, we would have different types of ways of preserving our rights to them. Uh, yeah. But we don't legally. So it creates and, and has and kind of traditionally has always had a very air of like, you, you don't talk about your formulas, you don't talk about where you get your supplies, like, you, yeah. that's love. Love, it's true. Like, we are truly friends if I tell you where I get something. <laughs> um, like, for, <laughs> for real, because people don't. I mean, they simply don't because there, where there are no protections. But in this day and age, you can put anything in a gas chromatograph and find out what it is. You yeah. know, if I have the lab equipment, I can put any perfume and I can get a pretty good readout of basically what's in there and I can start tinkering and you know reverse engineering from there. So mm -hmm. the age of that actually providing us any security to our, our creative process is over and has been over for 30 years now. Uh, so we need to find new ways of protecting uh, our our products and protecting our right to create and to have some semblance over what we create and also having transparency in in the whole process and we as an as an industry and i certainly can't speak for the whole industry but it feels that we don't have a clear way forward in how to how to do that how to regulate that so. mm -hmm. interesting um, so it, it seems like, because then this that sort of model would favor, say, bigger companies who can then just produce uh, multiple different like uh, scents at a time and take the loss if someone is trying to mimic their fragrance. But say for a smaller scale um, perfume house, your intellectual property is within the bottle and then everything that you sell, you in inevitably run the risk that it can then be uh, taken over, reconstituted. I mean, that's why there's such a, an emphasis on very unique labels and very unique packaging, because we can copyright that. And, mm -hmm. and we can fight those fights better mm -hmm. than we can fight for, for our juices. But um, I mean, there's there's been many times where people have, have made the accusation that such and such bigger house has perhaps stolen from some a smaller house house but it's very hard to prove that in court or to protect yourself legally in any way if that does actually happen yeah they never admit to it of course so. yeah. no. but that, that's it as you said there just there isn't the framework for these kind of things um that there just it just hasn't been in place because i think again historically there was no access for you know someone who, who has an interest like a keen interest in fragrance to just get up and make it and now again seeing that big shift as you were saying with the fact that you can literally display 
nearly all of everything that's in a fragrance if you have the right equipment that the the industry is almost hasn't caught up, caught up to that yet and again I, I can't speak on everything i've only been in it for three years but just from from the conversation yeah. i've had and what i've observed again there's this it seems in, in in many ways from from the diversity to the to the access it is is still playing catch up um you know to, to many many other creative industries um yeah well um well, great. I, I think, yeah, so to move from there, I was interested in, do you see any potential avenues for new interventions or new, uh, new ways of engaging either within this industry um, or what are, say, solutions out of it uh, that you've been thinking about or observed? Um, I mean, we're looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was lining up that question. <laughs> no, for real, that's okay. Your, your project really, um, I think, outlines something super important of just uh, proactivity and being uh, committed and, and make do, going straight for uh, going straight for it rather than just thinking about it, trying to make the best out of a situation like a pandemic. Um, I mean, yeah, I think you, you definitely you definitely show proactivity and, and it kind of gave an example of like, wow, there are alternative ways of thinking about how we can source things. Um, and depending on the scale, again, as, as you were saying, maybe not to a super huge economic scale, but maybe we're not, that's not the way we could start to think about it yet. It's not at that point to try and remodel, you know, huge giants in this industry. Maybe we do just have to try and figure out smaller approaches for now, which can build up um, just to kind of spin a perspective on it as well. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the way. I think... Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, just like, um... Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, just to, I was just to add, like, yeah, I agree with you, I think, on scaling up. It's not necessarily scaling up, it's that scaling across uh, laterally in different areas uh, at different sort of levels of what that sort of can look like. Um, mm. Yeah, I think the idea to always mimic the industrial scale um, or global capitalist model, you will never, and is that really the model that we want to sort of embrace continuously? Mm. Yeah. Sorry, Mary, you were going to say something. No, 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 it, it was perfect. Uh, I would just kind of add to that is that I kind of feel like we're already in an era for our, this industry moves very, very slowly. In a mm -hmm. lot of ways, it's, it's, it's almost medieval or early Renaissance in the way certain things are handled, and certain handshakes, yeah. right? That, it hasn't how, it hasn't changed how we how we teach other i mean there are there are more avenues now for teaching but for a very long period of time you had to find a perfumer whether through your company or or through apprenticeships like we did who's willing to invest in your education and it is an investment it's a huge investment mm -hmm. uh it's not it's it's not you can go to your local university and get a you know uh a, a course in perfumery um and i, I so i've we've already I think started to see these huge disruptions in, in one just having the internet and I don't think it's a surprise that we see the growth I mean and I put growth in, in commas of the sort of niche market um, at a time where the internet exploded yeah. because you had the traditional trade side of things still controls 90 percent of the market but yeah. you know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they controlled like 97% of the market. Um, and those that that growth of these small independent houses came out of the ability for smaller producers to access raw materials and to to access more importantly to access customers. And it's they're still somewhat linked into the traditional trade because a lot of times we're getting uh, materials sometimes <laughs> completely from these bigger companies so mm -hmm. we're uh, sort of also a, a customer to them but it's also an area of incredible creative growth and things tend to go into the niche kind of independent sphere as an incubator and you see the trade now kind of looks at it as an incubator to see you know where where are the trends going where, what are the kind of avant-garde things going to be and you see a huge range of, of products uh, so I think having that access on the internet and and having this kind of spirit of independence combined with more avenues for teaching, and it's still limited, but the fact that, you know, when the Institute of Art and Olfaction 
first opened up, there wasn't a lot of places where you could take a one-off course on how to build a Rosa Fort in English. That wasn't something that you could do with a trained person who knew what they were doing, who could give you good information that wasn't as readily available as is now. And there's lots of opportunities for education now. It's still not great and we still need lots of certification. And um, you know, I would love to see it become like cosmetic chemistry. I mean, there's, there's, there are universities that specialize in cosmetic chemistry that are completely separated from trade and you can get a degree in cosmetic chemistry. And I just feel that perfume chemistry should be right along with that. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, yeah I, hopefully, we, yeah, hopefully we will one day. It's kind of crazy that we don't. But I, I think what's going to be sort of the next stage of this is this sort of disruption is to have, especially with these very flexible, smaller perfumers, who can respond very quickly to the market because, and they have to because they're very sensitive. They don't have the same resilience is mm -hmm. to start having or trying to get more access directly, particularly with naturals. There's only so many places we can go for, for synthetic compounds, right? <laughs> There's a handful of labs. We all know the labs. We're going to go to one of them. Yeah. Um, but to be able to access those, raw materials directly to for i mean this is something i do in my own brand and it's incredibly challenging and you have to have a lot of skill set to be able to do that it's not something that's easily available to most um most brand owners uh but it provides a value add to your customers that they actually want to see i know who grew my roses i yeah. i went there and picked them you know like i can tell you where my rose oil comes from and that's something that I think has a lot of value. And I think we're going to see a greater influx of that. And I think we're going to see a greater influx of people who are doing the work on the ground, those who have access to means like the internet, they have that have the infrastructure already there, um, that are going to try to access the market themselves. I mm. think you're going to see things like, you know, rose products coming out of Bulgaria. I think you're going to see more of that just directly. People are going to distill because there's distillers right there like they pick the roses they distill the roses they happen in the same villages there's no reason why they can't pull a couple of kilos of rose oil and then make their own products and sell their own products online it's how the it direct it's kind of how grass started itself so why can't that model exist in other countries why does it have to go yeah. to france to become something uh when it was the same like spirit of how things began there I, I think uh, what I was thinking is like, would you think like um, certain decades were characterized by like big sense or aquatic or um, would the say shift now be also maybe if you can speculate on the trend in scent that it's more about transparency? And I don't necessarily mean in um, the actual fragrance, but maybe that the fragrance itself is a bit more stripped down. Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, it kind of depends. Um, you know, working working in in London, um, yeah, well, everyone, molecule, molecule one, everyone is just pumping that out, and I think that <laughs> that has done quite a significant thing in the canon of perfumery. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, again, then you have like you know, again, another. This is just like pop music uh perfume santal 33 i used to work in a nightclub so you know that was well, i smell it everywhere active everywhere. <laughs> and that you know, started, this, this is the you know that started supposedly yeah. as, a, as a candle fragrance so it's got this very linear um block kind of shape to it. it it starts as one shape and just kind of continues as that noise for a while um and mm. not knocking it it's it's a, it's a you know it wouldn't be as popular as it, as it is uh, if it wasn't well crafted and i think taking it traditionally a candle for put in a perfume is interesting as well not the first time but it's interesting but yeah so i think it depends on it depends on where you are um i think there are as nuri is saying though um what what uh you know she, she, what nuri what you're doing is i think is like a really um innovative approach to perfumery that i think mm -hmm. i hope we'll we'll see more of in the future because again it's that that proactive attitude i think is again a way of not trying to reach a single destination of just 
focusing and picking at all the bad parts of the industry but having a, a direct uh, approach of, of yeah work, working towards uh, decolonizing a, met a method and practice um, mm -hmm. rather than seeing it as one final place to reach is something we have to constantly work towards so I think yeah Nuri what you're doing is a really great step in that direction but yeah I mean terms of transpar there's different trends everywhere you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it's hard. I think I think overall there's I, I think you're right in that it's almost like perfume the last 10 years has been become very abstract it's how mm. can we make it as linear once again linear as possible the idea of it having this arc and yeah. you're having this experience for, with your perfume that should change over time people really don't want that they also want a lot of longevity yeah to the point it's just like it's a, it's you're spraying it on your body it has alcohol on it there's only so lo how long i can keep it on your skin uh because yeah. It just, you know, you hear people talking about they want 36, you know, 48 hours of a product remaining and, and the same, uh, yeah. which is not yeah. how nature works. This feels unnatural. It, it always feels kind of these these kind of modern fragrances that always give a very clean smell, um, you know, sort of uh, pleasant. They're pleasant. They're pleasant smells. They're like pop music. They're white noise smells. Yeah. Um, I think I also think that this is also kind of a trend, though. I think it's going to be the same equivalent to how powdery fragrances were in like the 60s and that people will smell these very linear, very kind of abstract, you know, single molecule fragrances and be like, oh, my God, my grandmother smells like that. You know, in 30 years, this will be yeah. a grandma. Smell. It'll become very dated. Um, yeah. But, you know, here in the Middle East, it's still we're still going real hard on the place. <laughs> you know, big, big, loud, long, uh, you know, uh, still a lot of musk, a lot of woods. Um, oud is more popular than ever. In regions where it previously wasn't, you know, mm. in Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, that really wasn't an oud area. And now everybody's wearing oud. And it's like, okay, all right. It's the golf all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, so we're even having cross references of fragrance because of these movings in the market, because that ha that wasn't part of our, our scent tradition to the extent it was in the golf. Uh, but it's still, we're still pretty big and pretty, pretty loud over here. So we're definitely not like linear and clean and soft. Yeah. You really want your presence known in a given space. I would say similar in Kenya. Which is, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, which is very different from, for instance, China. And both Middle Eastern brands and uh, Western brands have had a really hard time accessing China because they want their scents to be very close to the body and very low. So it should be nice and it should be pleasant, but it should be very, very close. Not and if not intrusive, you need to think of other people when you're scenting yourself. And that's not the way we approach product in most countries, uh, especially in the French kind of standardized way of looking at perfume. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it's a communist way of approaching fragrance and we are not prepared for that. Fascinating study into like the way people engage in societies through the way they wear yeah. the fragrances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think, to, yeah. Um, Maybe, yeah, my final question, and this is just more, I'm curious to see where you guys began, but um, why did you begin entering into this work and what compels you to, um, say, continue working in it? Um, Ezra, you want to go? I can go, I can go. Um, I, uh, I I always uh, really appreciated um, just the sense of smell. Um, I, I I'm terrible notoriously at forgetting people's names, um, but I like weirdly remember the, how their house smelled or something like that. If I ever smell it again, it's, oh, that's that place. And um, it was again kind of through uh, a small retail experience. After that, um, find my way into a laboratory and trying to understand uh, fragrance perfumery as as this kind of design um, mechanism. And it was a, definitely a situation of I didn't know what I didn't know at the beginning. I think I, I, I couldn't conceive what the role or the job of a perfumer to be a real thing, um, let alone how complicated it is. Um, but I think that's the the kind of the challenge that draws me back to it. A is the the kind of design uh, method of trying mm -hmm. to create create a shape that you can't touch or see 
and like project that into someone's memory or someone's imagination is yeah. always like interests me just as as that is like what it is what it does in the body but i think also um again just uh, wanting to find another way to tell stories um like how i've worked with people in the past like the best the best collaborations i've done so far um one with an art artist called shimba masai um who's who's from zimbabwe originally and moved to moved to england some years ago he uh we we were working uh on a project with him for one of his events uh for a show that he did a mu music show and mm -hmm. I went I went to him and like giving him different showing different materials to him he was coming up with uh memory had memories nostalgic responses and the, the vocabulary he was using was so different to what I'd experienced in a, in the lab environment and it it really made me um it really just drove me and in the end we ended up making this very interesting mix of what was essentially super nostalgic smells of him which he described as like red brick and petrichor from mud lifting combined with like really metallic, um, like kind of cold hard structures. So we wanted to try and make this kind of like a satellite um, essentially, uh, like flying around like Sunrise, yeah, Jupiter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing that pushes me is yeah. storytelling, I think, and trying to elevate voices that um, haven't had uh, a platform so so far. That's That's what pushes me further anyway. I'm super excited by exploring that space. Um, but yeah, Nori. Yeah. So. Uh, that's amazing, by the way. <laughs> Just, we're going to satellite to Saturn. Excellent. <laughs> I love it. Um, so for me, I, I'd say like the, my first experience with perfume was really, uh, I think telling in, in the long run, I was begging my parents for years for it. I wanted perfume. I wanted to be a grown up. I was tired of, I was one of these kids who was 37. And they finally capitulated when I was eight and they bought me a bottle of baby sauce, which is pink and smells like baby powder. It is it is like the kiddie perfume. Mm -hmm. And I sprayed it and I was like, ah, oh, I'm a grown up, I'm grown. And it was just like this amazing ability to um, reframe my reality without changing anything tangibly. Uh, but because I felt that way, because I had this smell, because I had this ritual of applying this perfume, it meant so much to me. And I was just a big fan of perfume. I bought a lot of perfume. I had a big collection. I was interested in it. But it was years later. Um, I am a member of a Hedra Kadisha, which is a uh, burial society. It's a Jewish burial society that um, uh, we take care of our own within our community. So we don't charge people, we don't have for profit funeral homes, we take care of our own people That's inside the community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful model, a communal model to say that, you know, this matters um, too much to be something to make profit off of. And I had a family that was insisting that the final ablution of the body of the person who had died should be with rose water. They were from Iraq, they were Iraqi Jews, and they wanted to have rose water because that was part of their tradition. So there was some argument over whether or not we should we should do it. And so I got actually called in because I, I knew the rules better. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, we can do it. We'll, we'll do the rose water. But it really got me thinking like, who is this rose water for? Like she's dead. She's not enjoying this rose water. We're functioning here. We're, this is not for our pleasure. So who is this rose water for? What is the function that this is doing? And that just started me down a path that's very strange and weird. And it just, it was always sent through people, sent through culture, sent through expression. And, mm -hmm. and eventually got to a point where it's like, well, I have to learn how to do it. it, it I can't just talk about it in abstract terms. I have to make these things. Um, and I think that's also why a lot of the things I make are much more traditional because um, I'm looking at tradition and I'm looking at culture. So I, it tend, I tend to move a little bit slower, maybe a little bit more old fashioned, but uh, it's always been through the, the lens of society. So that's kind of how I got into things, which is not the usual way. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a so, wonderful yeah. story. <laughs> oh, thank you. Fantastic. I think you touched on something really important that it's always sent through some, like you can't have it without sort of experiencing it. It's 
uh, as a sense, but it also like it continuously uh, engages within certain other spheres, uh, yeah. communities, societies, cultures. Um, it's funny because it kind of acts like a like an echo, but it's also a glue. I think to like making kind of putting our senses together. So it is the kind of like after impression, uh, whether that's you know felt internally as like a nostalgic thing, or if it's from someone else, it's someone else's echo of being in a space, or you having been in a space. But it's, it is also yeah that kind of glue that that solidifies um, you know felt phenomena. Um, which, which I just think, yeah. Again, this act, aside from industry and aside from some, it, as a, as a, as a sense, uh, and and how, as Nuri was saying, it has so many uh, links uh, to, to to life practices, to death practices, to to just cultures. Um, yeah, I find that in, in incredible, um, and communicating that as as a really interesting device. Sorry, one second. Uh. But also for you, what made you interested in wanting to pursue the ideas around scent and design or scent and process the way you approach it? Because you have a very different um, well, I mean, platform I, that you're coming from than me. I think to add to you, uh, like when I was younger, I would uh, I kept collecting perfume bottles, and it was as well, uh, you know, twelve. But I want to be, you know like a gentleman um, or sexy, I don't know. Uh, can you do that? Yeah, maybe. Um, so <laughs> there was a lot of that sort of uh, collecting and I think the whole time I've always been interested in how places smell and they really ground me back into something. And I think if you're moving around a lot, uh, scent is also like a very important thing related to that. Mm. Um, but I think with design, I, at least initially as the, the work I'd been seeing or the research that was being done into scent, it just seems so sterile and um, we can design this, like it's super directional. And, um, and uh, also I think back to this like lack of criticality related to it, but then also just the way that our environments did smell before. And I think, uh, especially in the Netherlands, I think that's where I got interested in it because of how deodorized the Netherlands is through a lot of processes of design. And I questioned or wondered uh, what have we lost in that process of what we can't smell anymore, um, which is related to the way the economy has changed, um, also maybe related to the way uh, people engage in different social practices. Um, and yeah, so... I think that's yeah initially where I came from, and then I think again to add, it was also and you said something really wonderful sculpting with memories. Um, I really love this idea that you could play around with something and that uh, everyone would have a different experience towards it, but that you would feel something related to it. It, it sort of brings a level of humanity um, to it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, um, I think that was that was great. 